Turn with me to two places this morning. One is Romans 14. We'll be there just for a minute at the beginning. And then turn to Galatians 4 as well, or you can turn after Romans. And that's going to be the main passage, Lord willing, that we look at this morning is Galatians chapter 4. But first I want you to think about Romans chapter 14, verse 17 this morning. I want you to listen to what the Bible says to us in that verse. It says, For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. The reason I bring up this verse this morning is to tell you a story about maybe the greatest preacher of last century. He was a preacher overseas, and he one he didn't always do this, but one thing that he did was preach through books of the Bible or sections of the Bible. And he spent about 13 or 14 years preaching through the first 14 chapters of Romans. There's a, a man, he came over, from, I think from America, that came, came and heard him preach, and he was in Romans chapter 3, I don't know what verse he was. He left, went back to America. He came back the next year and said, where are we at in Romans now? And they were still in Romans chapter 3. Now, I'm not saying that's what every preacher ought to do. But for him, God blessed it mightily as he broke down small portions of Scripture and as he went along and went along. The reason I bring this up is this. The last sermon he ever preached at the church, the last church he pastored before he had cancer, found out he had cancer, retired from pastoring, was the verse that we just read in Romans 14. He didn't get to preach the whole verse though. The last sermon he ever preached in that pulpit as pastor was a sermon on the peace of God there. This is what he said. He said that he believed that God did not allow him to finish preaching on joy in the Holy Spirit because he did not know enough of that for himself to preach on that. Now, if what is maybe, if who is maybe the greatest preacher of last century, and as far as I know, I think he was the greatest preacher of last century, if he could say that about himself, what can I and you say about ourselves? With that in mind, I want us to turn to Galatians 4. What I want us to do this morning, I hope, is to see something of the glory of being a son of God. And I hope that this will help increase our joy and our understanding of what it is to be a Christian. I hope it increases mine as I preach. I hope it increases yours as you listen And I hope that it will increase our joy as we leave and we live this Christian life. Here is the bottom line. You and I live far below what God has done for us. Can I hear an amen this morning? And I'm not even speaking about the way we live, though certainly at times that's true. What I'm talking about is we live far below what God, understanding what God has done for us. That's the reality. We live far below. I live far below. And, and as we look at the Bible and as we study and as we, we, we read and as we pray, we learn more. And what a joy it's going to be in heaven. I was thinking while I was sitting over there just of some of the good people that we've lost. Some of the people we've lost even in the time I've been here at this church. And for the Christian who dies and goes on, Joy is waiting Him. The joy of God. The depths, the depths of the glory and the joy of God. Understanding more of who He is. And one thing that the Bible does for us, the Bible in one sense condescends down to our level. God speaks in human terms. He speaks about the family of God, doesn't He? We understand, at least to some degree, what a family is. So we can relate to being part of the family of God. God comes down. He speaks on our level. He speaks about being part of the body of Christ. 
We have a body. We can understand when our hand hurts. It affects our whole body. Our foot or our, our big toe or whatever. It may not be that big of a deal, but when it hurts, it affects the whole body, doesn't it? And everything's important in the church of Jesus Christ. Every person is important. And what we see here in, in Galatians 4 is, is one of these terms or more than one term that God uses. He condescends down to our level in love and He talks about us being adopted into the family of God. Isn't that a wonderful thing to think about? We who once belonged to the devil, we who once belonged to the evil one, not only did we belong to Him, we did His will, not only did Christ die for your sins, but He died for our sins. In other words, part of the reason He died is because we killed Him. Because of our sins. And yet the people who in that sense killed Jesus, and even those who were there that day who actually killed Him, who put Him on the cross, though He gave His life up willingly, God makes all people Sons of God, regardless of our past. That's what we're going to see today. Look here in this chapter. We're going to start out in verse 1. Let's just be reminded of where we come from. When I went off to college uh, from East Kentucky, I had, a, I had a sister in the faith. You know what she told me? She said, don't forget where you came from. And I hope I haven't done that. Don't forget where you came from. Well, listen, as Christians, I don't want to dwell in my past sins. Do you? Do you want to dwell in the things you used to do? Unless they help you understand what God has done for you. Look what it says here. Let's start in. I want you to see what we used to be. Paul says, Now I say, as long as the heir is a child. The first two verses here, he's dealing with human relationships. Just helping us understand on a human level what he's talking about. As long as the heir is a child, he does not differ at all from a slave, although he is owner of everything. Paul says, in effect, listen, you've got, a, you've got an eight-year-old boy, and his dad's a billionaire. And one day, this eight-year-old boy is going to be a billionaire. But until he is, he's just an eight-year-old boy. And look what he says in verse 2. But he is under guardians and managers until the date set by the father. Paul says this eight-year-old boy, he, he is just like a slave right now. He's an heir of everything. One day he's going to have an inheritance. One day everything's coming to him. Until that day, he's going to have to obey his teachers. He's going to have to obey the servants. He's going to have to obey those who are over him. It doesn't matter if he's going to be the head honcho one day. He's just a boy. He's a child. He's going to have to obey until his father says he can inherit the goods. And he compares that to what we were. Verse 3, So also we... While we were children, were held in bondage under the elemental things of the world. What are these elemental things? Your versions may translate that slightly different. But what are these things here that he's talking about? Look down in verse 8. However, at that time when you did not know God... You were slaves to those which by nature are no gods. One thing he's talking about is what we used to be enslaved to. Uh, just think the sins you used to be enslaved to. I remember as a young man, uh, though I don't believe I was a Christian at that time, I was feeling very guilty about the things I was doing, and I said, you know what, I'm going to stop. And that lasted a couple days. Because I wanted to go back. Why? Because I was enslaved to sin. We can be enslaved to drugs. We can be enslaved to alcohol. Those are things that are usually easy for us and other people to see. But we can be enslaved to self-righteousness. We can be enslaved to the fact that we think we can save ourselves. We can be enslaved to so much. And the reality is this. We may drop some of these old sins we were once enslaved to. Some of you probably did. You think about a drunk. And he says, this drinking's destroying my family. I'm giving it up. And he does. That's good. The truth is, that doesn't make him a Christian, though. 
He's still enslaved to sin, capital S, in the singular, though he may give up some sins in the plural. We're enslaved to so many different things. Look what it says in verse 9. But now that you have come to know God, or rather to be known by God, you know Him now, he says. How is it that you turn back again to the, to the weak and worthless elemental things to which you desire to be enslaved all over again. In the context here, Paul is, again, he's speaking to the Galatians as he has. He's saying, listen, you guys have been saved. You've been born again. And now you want to go back to obeying the ceremonial law. What are you doing? You want to go back to, to when you were a child. Isn't it a sad thing to see an adult act like a child? Isn't it a sad thing to see a 40-year-old who's not grown up yet? Isn't that a terrible thing? The fact is, these Galatian Christians, they have grown up. They have rejoiced in salvation. And now they want to go back to being kids again. Look in verse 10. You observe days and months and seasons and years. Listen, he says, why are you going back to these things? Not that they're bad. He's talking, and I'm talking about the law now. The law is holy and good, but the law had a purpose to lead us to Christ as we saw two weeks ago. So here we have, we have these people, they are under the, they are trying to go back under the law, and for us, we were once like that. Now we, almost all, if not all of us, are, are Gentiles, and yet the law of God is written on our hearts and we disobey the law of God. And in that sense, we're under the law. We're under the condemnation of the law. And, and what Paul is saying to us is this. This is what you used to be. This is a happy passage we're looking at. You used to be like this. You used to be under these elemental things. Don't you remember that? You used to be in these sins. You used to be that. But you're not there anymore. And I want you to notice secondly here in, in this passage, the price. This is one of the joys of Christianity. Is knowing that God loves us. And how do we know that God loves us? We know that He loves us because of the price or the payment that He made for us to make us His sons. To make us His sons. We belong to the devil. How do we ever get free? You don't walk into somebody's house and take someone's son and make them your son, do you? So how did God take us from the evil one and make us His sons? Verse 4 and verse 5. But when the fullness of the time came, God sent forth His Son. What's amazing in this passage is God is said to send forth His Son, and then He sends forth His Spirit. The Spirit of His Son. But when the fullness of time came, you think about all the promises in the Old Testament, the promises given to Adam and Eve right when they sinned about someone coming, a seed of the woman stepping on the serpent's head. You look throughout the Old Testament of all these promises, and some people probably said to themselves, why isn't God working yet? Why is He not sending and fulfilling His promises? Some of you may go through hardship. You go through trial in life. You've gone through things and you say, I wonder why God... You don't ask this in unbelief, but you ask us out of a child's heart as God wants us to. You say, I wonder why God is allowing this to happen. I wonder why God is not stopping this yet. And we know that God has a plan for us as His people. Amen? God has a plan for us. But when the fullness of the time came, God sent forth His Son, born of a woman, just like we are. Born under the law, just like the Jews. What's that telling us? It's telling us that Jesus Christ had to become as we are so we could become as He is, a son so that He might redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. Jesus Christ bought you. That is how you became adopted to God. Is Jesus Christ on the cross 
suffering for our sins, under the wrath of God, suffering for things He did not do. Christ Jesus paid the penalty of the law. He paid the penalty of God's wrath. And He purchased us for His own people. Listen, you may have someone who's adopted and they're young right now. And they don't understand what the parents have gone through. They don't understand the cost and the sacrifices, whether the adoption costs zero or whether, can you believe this, it costs 50000 There's all kinds of kids that need to be adopted. Why, why, do they, why do some people have to pay 50000 to adopt a kid? What's wrong with our, our country and these things going on? What's wrong with this? But this child grows up and becomes an adult, he looks back and he begins to think about the sacrifices his parents made. He begins to think even maybe how much it cost. Though that sounds strange, I know. How much it cost for them to adopt him. And he thinks back to how much money. He knew he knew his family didn't have that much money. Why? Why would why would a family go through that to adopt someone for? I'll tell you why. It's because of love, isn't it? When Emma Jo was born, she was our firstborn. When Emma Jo was born, I had never seen anything so beautiful like that in all my life. She, uh, she had a heart problem. She was in the NICU. She was the biggest baby there. But, and, and I won't get into all the story. Courtney can tell you more. She was the most beautiful thing I'd ever seen in all my life. I still have a, about a, a minute and a half video of that little girl there. And all my girls I love and they're beautiful. I don't want them to feel, <laughs> think anything bad about this. But Emma was the firstborn. I saw her. I'd never seen anything like that in my life. Can you all understand? Here's the reality, isn't it? Some of our kids when they were younger weren't that beautiful. But we thought they were. You know what? I didn't, I didn't make a choice for what Emma was. I didn't make a choice. When you adopt someone, you do make a choice, don't you? And here is God sending His Son on a rescue mission, not for the brightest and the smartest, not for the prettiest, not for the best behaved, but He has sent His Son for sinners to give His blood The blood that He shed, the Bible says, for the church. He shed His blood to buy us. He chose us, didn't He? To redeem us. When you think about redemption, one of the great stories you think about is the book of Hosea, the prophet Hosea. Here is a prophet whose wife goes into harlotry. The holy prophet's wife not only commits adultery, she becomes an adulteress and runs into that. And in the third chapter, do you know what happens to the prophet? Some, If that wasn't bad enough, his wife goes into even deeper things apparently. And in the third chapter of the book of Hosea, the prophet shows up and buys his wife back. He purchases her, he pays for her, and takes her home to love her. My friends, Jesus Christ has come and died and purchased us so we can come back to Him. Never doubt the love of God for your soul. Never doubt that. I want you to look next though in verse 6. As wonderful as the things that we have seen are, and they are wonderful, and it is wonderful, as, as beautiful as it is for the Son of God to come and to redeem us and for us to know that He loves us through seeing what He has done for us, we have, as it's been said, we have the standing of sonship. The standing of sonship. Whether we're male or female, we are sons of God. We have that standing. I want you to see here, and this is very instructive to us and helpful, that Christianity is not theoretical. That's, that's something we mentioned, I think, last, last, last Sunday. We talked about that. When we talked about being one in Christ. Christianity is not 
something that is in our mind only. Christianity is something that is real and we experience. It would be wonderful if, if we had the Bible and if God, God gave us faith to believe what His Bible says, that Jesus died for us 2,000 years ago, that we are now sons of God. That would be wonderful and we would praise God for that. Can I tell you this, that God has done more than that? Can I tell you that God has done far more than that? Is that God has allowed us to experience the sonship of God. Look what verse 6 says. Because you are sons. Yes, He purchased us. Yes, He gave us the adoption. Yes, if you want to say it this way, we have the papers. And we thank the Lord for giving us His Bible. Because you are sons. That's not all. God has sent forth the Spirit of His Son into our hearts, crying... Abba, Father. That's it. You as Christians not only have the Bible as wonderful and as essential as that is, but if you are a Christian this morning, you have been given the Spirit of God and He lives in you right now. God has not left us as orphans in this world. God has come to us and He has given us of His Spirit and He has not just simply allowed the influences of His Spirit on our lives, brothers and sisters, but it says He has sent forth the Spirit of His Son into our hearts. God dwells in our hearts. He, the Spirit of God is in our innermost being. Friends, we have the Spirit of God within us. Let me, let me give you a few of these wonderful truths of what this means for us. One thing that means is this. The Spirit of God is our pledge. Our pledge. Why don't you turn to Ephesians 1. Ephesians chapter 1, we read some from that. We didn't read these verses though earlier. Chapter 1 of Ephesians. Listen to how the Bible describes the Spirit of God. God has given us His Spirit. Your Bibles may say earnest here. Look in verse 13. In Him, you also, this is in Christ Jesus, you also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed. None of this happens before you believe. You're not sons until you believe. You're not adopted until you believe. You were sealed in Him with the Holy Spirit of promise. Now verse 14, who is given as a pledge or an earnest of our inheritance. Now what's that mean? Let me give you maybe two illustrations, and I say both of these reverently. When the Father sends the Spirit of His Son to live within us, what the, what the Father is doing is giving us a pledge. You all know what pledges are. You go to a house. You lock the house. Of course, you may or may not have enough money to buy the house, but you lay down the $1,000 down payment for the house. And that is the sign that you're telling the person you're buying the house, you're telling the realtor, you're telling the bank, you're saying, listen, I want to buy this house, I'm coming back with the money, and here's a thousand dollars to let you know I'm coming. When you feel and sense the Spirit of God moving and working in your heart, giving peace, convicting of sin, when you have the Spirit of God producing His fruit in your heart, that is God saying there's more yet to come. We don't get anything better than the Spirit, but we get more of the Spirit. And not only more of the Spirit, but we are people who have the pledge of God that will have the inheritance one day. You, uh, you men, you that are, have, uh, have been married and 
You, uh, you, put, you give that young lady an engagement ring and you say, we're not married yet, but this ring is, is showing you that I'm serious, we're engaged now, and one day when that date comes, we will be married. The Holy Spirit is that pledge to us. God says, when you go through heartache, when you go through trial, remember I have given you my Spirit, I have not left you, I am with you. And the inheritance is coming one day. Not only is the Spirit of God our pledge, but the Spirit of God gives us the assurance that we are sons of God. It says there back in Galatians, because you are sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of His Son. You see, He's, he's not, He's not withholding anything from us. He didn't give us a secondary Spirit. He gave us the Spirit of His own Son because we are truly sons of God. I want you to listen to Romans 8. Romans chapter 8, verse 15 and 16. The Bible says, For you have not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again, but you have received a spirit of adoption as sons by which we cry out, Abba, Father. Verse 16, The Spirit Himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. How do we know we're Christians? One of the ways that you know you're a Christian is that God's own Spirit witnesses to your spirit that you are a Christian. Now, you can be a true Christian without that witness. Maybe God has withdrawn it for a time to get your attention. Maybe God has withdrawn it because you've grieved the Spirit. The fact is this, though. When you deal with somebody... And, and they just cannot get assurance of salvation. One of the most dangerous things, though certainly there's, there's times of just someone's in a, in a great despond and you need to help that person along. But one of the great dangers you can do to someone is try to give them assurance. That's not our job to do. I can take them through the Bible. I can show them the Bible says this. I can show them that, look, you you say you've repented. I've seen fruit in that in your life. And the Bible shows you that fruit. I can can help them see. I can help them see things. But one of the most dangerous things in life is going to someone and saying, ah, that's the devil. Forget about it. It's just the devil. You know, when I was when I was young in the faith, the devil used to make me think I wasn't a Christian and I got over it too. You get over it as well. That's one of the most dangerous things you can ever do to somebody. Because it is not us, it is not the pastor, it isn't our mom and dad that gives us assurance. It is the Spirit of God that gives assurance of salvation. The assurance of salvation comes by believing God's truth. The assurance of salvation comes by seeing God's Word and saying, you know what? God is changing me. I see, I'm I'm living like His Word says. I'm growing. And the assurance of salvation comes by the witness of the Spirit and what we have experienced in our heart. How do we know we're sons of God? It's not simply by reading the Word of God, as wonderful as that is. How do we know we are the sons of God? It's because God's Son, Spirit, dwells in us. And He witnesses with our spirit that we belong to Him. That we are His. Then I want you to look again in chapter 4. What else? The giving of the Spirit means to us. Because you are sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of His Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Abba there is an Aramaic word that means Father. Father there is the Greek word translated into English. One thing I think you see there is this. It doesn't matter where you come from. It doesn't matter what language you speak. We call God Father if we're His. It doesn't matter our backgrounds. He's our Father. That's all that matters. doesn't matter if you're Jew or Gentile. He's our Father. doesn't matter what language you speak naturally. We all speak God's language. We all say, Father. I want us to see here this intimacy we have. This is the greatest privilege in life that we have, Christian, is to call on God in prayer. And to be able to call God our Father. 
This shows that we are the sons of God. I know there's people who abuse this. I know there's people who call God Father while they live in willful sin. This obviously isn't speaking of that, but it is speaking of the experience of the true Christian who has come to know who God is, and by coming to know who God is, they call Him Father. Now, I remember when I was younger in the faith, back in Kentucky, I was struggling with assurance of salvation and one morning pretty early I woke up in bed and all I could say was, God is my Father. God is my Father. God is my Father. And I went back to bed. God was helping me see that He is my Father. He was assuring me He is my Father. And we know this, don't we? When the deepest, darkest nights of our soul comes, we call Him Father, don't we? And He hears our cry. When the heartaches we've been looking at Job, and I would encourage you if you haven't been coming on Wednesday nights to come and listen as we look at Job and the suffering he went through and how God helped him and what we learn about God through this great book of Job. But Job in his deepest, darkest times could call upon his God. And what Jesus taught us, it was radical. We take the fatherhood of God for granted. We, we call God Father all the time. We never think about what that means, do we? He is the Creator what does Jesus say in Matthew chapter 5? He makes this amazing statement, Matthew chapter 6, about prayer. He says, Pray then in this way, our Father who is in heaven. Think of the contrast there. God who is in heaven. God who creates us. God who is our Lord. God who is over our life and can take our breath away anytime He wants to. God is our Father. There's intimacy now. There was once fear. We once ran from God. We used not want to hear His name. Martin Luther was scared about the righteousness of God until he understood what that meant. That it was the gift that God gave us. And here we have in this book is is the gospel of Jesus Christ, the gospel of grace being explained and expounded for us in the book of Galatians. And what you have are people who already know that God is their Father wanting to go back to these little things to make them right with God. And Paul says, no, you are already the people of God. Now look what verse 7 says. Listen, I've said this before. I would hate to get in an argument with the Apostle Paul. I've seen it like I've never seen it before as, we, as we've studied Galatians, that Paul would absolutely cut and dice and slice any person he spoke to in a loving way. He was a genius. He was a man with the Spirit of God, but naturally he was a genius. The arguments he makes are absolutely, you cannot even break through. You're left in a corner crying somewhere unless you give in to what He's saying. Then you're rejoicing. But He takes our sonship in Christ and He leads us down this road. We were once slaves, but God has adopted us. He has made us sons by grace. Not only has He made us sons, but He's given us His Spirit that we cry, Abba, Father. We have the experience of sonship. But then what He says in verse 7 is this, Therefore you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. Now some of you ladies, I mentioned this last week, but some of you ladies may be feeling left out. It doesn't say daughters of God here. But what we need to see here is the Bible uses the words it uses for a reason. It says sons of God because, in part, at that time, and really for most of human history, daughters did not inherit anything from the fathers. What you see here is Christianity is radically different. What we see here is Christianity says that, that 
physical males and physical ladies, when they become Christians, they have the same status. They are both sons of God. In other words, in Christ Jesus, there is no difference between male and female, as we saw last week. In Christ Jesus, it doesn't matter if you're a male or a female, when you get saved, you're a son of God, and the inheritance comes to you, just like a physical son. The Bible calls us the bride of Christ. Men and women, the bride of Christ. Here the Bible calls men and women sons of God because both man and both woman inherits what God has for them. Let me turn to one more verse at least this morning. Romans chapter 8. This is a verse that at times I use to help and to comfort people who are suffering or sick. We're heirs of God. The world's crazy right now, isn't it? It's always been crazy, but it's, it's really crazy right now. You may lose your job. You may lose your family. According to what country you live in. You may lose your life over certain things. You can't lose God's inheritance though. That's what gives Christians the drive to obey God no matter what. That's what leads us to say yes to God even though it costs us everything. That's why the the mistake that the rich young ruler made was so foolish. The rich young ruler comes to Jesus. He's a rich man. He's young. He's got his life before him, he thinks. And Jesus says, if you sell everything you have, you can have treasures in heaven. And the rich man says, no, I'm not going to do that. He likes his treasures on earth. And yet he didn't realize the treasures that God had for him. Romans chapter 8, verse 18. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed to us or in us. You know, if you looked in your hymn book this morning, you know what you would find, especially in... uh, like the, the little red hymnals. You all know what I'm talking about, don't you? The Stamp Baxter songs and things. In the uh, early 1920s and so, what you'll find is this. You'll have song and song and song after hev- about heaven, about heaven, about heaven. Why is that? It's because in the 1920s and, and around that time period, it's the Great Depression. And you didn't have a bunch of goods laying around at home for most people. You struggle to survive. So they're going to sing and sing and sing about what they're going to get one day, and that's not a bad thing, that's a good thing. They would sing about heaven and how good it's going to be. And I may not have much here on earth, but I have everything in heaven, and I'm going to see Jesus, and I'm going to see my loved ones one day. I don't have much on earth, but I'm going to see Him one day. We don't sing about heaven much anymore, do we? I remember reading a book, listening to a book some years ago, a really good book about ten, ten signs you're growing as a Christian. One of the signs was you're thinking and talking about heaven more. And the author of that book at the time that he, that he was looking back at was a young pastor and he kept having these older people talking about heaven and thinking about heaven all the time. He said, he just thought, you know, why, why are they doing this for? We gotta live now. And then he saw, no, that's a sign of maturity, actually. I mean, who wouldn't want to go home? Who wouldn't want to go and be with their, their kin, their Savior, and the rewards that God had stored up for us? You know what's happened to us in America? We've got a little too much of heaven on earth, don't we? What I mean is, We've got a little too much good sometimes in heaven, and down here on earth, don't we? Nothing wrong about having goods. We should thank the Lord for those who do and use it correctly. We thank the Lord for that. The fact is this, without Christ Jesus, we have nothing on earth. We got nothing. I remember my pastor telling me about a man. I don't know if he died at that time or later, but a man who was sitting on his deathbed in the hospital perhaps, and my pastor coming to talk to him, to witness to him. 
And he was talking about all the stuff he had. I'll tell you what, I don't want to leave this world without Jesus. I don't care what you give me. I don't care if the Nazis come in right now by God's grace. I don't want to deny Jesus. Because there's some things that this world can't take from you. There's only one thing, and that's God's things. They can't take it from you. They can take a lot from you. They can't take that though. Jesus says, take your treasures and lay them upon in heaven. Why? Because moth and rust cannot reach there. They can reach here on earth. We're sons of God. We're sons, aren't we? How much do we think about heaven? I want to think more about it. How much do we think about our inheritance? And let me ask this question. Do we believe we have one anymore? We're all affected by this, don't we? I'm affected by this. This secular culture, this unbelief that's everywhere, we're all affected by it. I am so thankful that by God's grace alone, I have learned to trust in Jesus. And here's what I've found. Every time I doubt Jesus, I come back thinking how much of a fool I am because He's never let me down once. He's never let me down. He's always been there for me. The devil doesn't want you to think about your inheritance because he's afraid you might get too happy and serve God with joy on earth. Richard Baxter was one of the great pastors, preachers, hundreds of years ago. He spent about 30 minutes every day thinking about heaven. Why? Richard, someone may say, Pastor Baxter, I should say. Pastor Baxter, why do you spend? There's people dying. You want to go house to house and catechize people. There's people dying. You need to evangelize. Why are you spending 30 minutes a day thinking about heaven? Because we need to get our strength somewhere, don't we? If all you look at is this world, we're going to be miserable. We need to get our strength from somewhere, and our strength comes in part by knowing what's awaiting us. I used to, I used to play sports, and we used to run. Oh, and I hated just running just for running. I wanted to do sports and running, but not just running. But some of you can realize this, whether it's sports or whether it's a long day at work, you're wore out, but then all of a sudden you see where it's going to end, and all of a sudden you get a little bit more... Pep in your step. It's almost over. Let me go. I can make it. I can make it. I can make it. I'm almost there. But when we see that heaven's going to be ours one day, our step picks up. Our joy picks up. And let me tell you, the devil, the devil doesn't want you to be a joy-filled Christian. You see, when, when, when you become a Christian, you're free from the devil in the sense that he doesn't have you in bondage anymore. And the devil's not power enough, powerful enough to reach into God's hands and pull us out of his hands. The devil himself cannot do that. You know what the devil can do though? The devil can make you miserable. Am I right? The devil can make you not trust God's promises. The devil can make you think that the person next to you in the pew is your enemy when it's actually the devil who's your enemy. And as long as the devil has you like that, well, you might as well not be saved anyway because you're not going to do much for the kingdom. I've been there before. I've been there under issues of conscience, under distress, under things that I ought not to be under, but my mind is not thinking right and I'm not trusting God and all these things are pressing in on me and all I'm doing is thinking about myself. You know, that's one of the, the greatest deceptions of legalism as one of my old professors wrote about. One of the greatest deceptions of legalism is that it makes you just think about you and you forget about everybody else. When all you think about is you, you can't think about the next person, can you? When all you're thinking, if, if all I'm thinking about is me, how can I think about you? That is why in the Bible we have these great and precious promises. That is why God has given us His Spirit so we can know we belong to Him. 
So we can know we have an inheritance one day. So we can know we don't have to go back to the law. We don't have to go back to the works of the law to save us. We need to be baptized if we have not been. But baptism didn't save you. You were saved before you were baptized. Jesus is enough. And if we're sons of God, that's enough. That's enough. May the Lord bless you this morning.